Hi debaters, welcome back. This is part two of a 2023 topic lecture on the economic inequality topic. So this is what's gonna be going on in part two. We're gonna go through key concepts in the resolution, including fiscal redistribution, a federal jobs guarantee, expanding social security, and basic income. So to review from the first part, uh, and if you haven't watched that, I would probably go watch that first, but to review the resolution is resolved, the United States federal government should substantially increase fiscal redistribution in the United States by adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding social security, and or providing a basic income. And so if you break the resolution down, there are kind of four key concepts um, that we should discuss in further detail. Uh, fiscal redistribution, the concept of a federal jobs guarantee, Social Security and the idea of expanding it and the idea of providing a basic income. So let's start with fiscal redistribution. One thing that's important to understand when you're thinking about fiscal redistribution is the difference between fiscal policy and monetary policy and, and sort of what the word fiscal means. Um, and fiscal policy means the taxing and spending policies of the federal government. And in the United States, those taxing and spending policies are determined by Congress and to a somewhat lesser extent, the executive. Um, but we're, when we're talking about fiscal policy, we're talking about managing deficits and surpluses and making decisions about the federal budget. So how much do we tax and who do we tax and what kind of taxes should we have? And also where should that money go? Um, should that money go to social services? Should it go to the military? Should it go to education? Um, what kind of uh, income should we bring in and what kind of outlay should happen? So taxes and spending policies. Um, the other type of major, uh, the other major type of economic policy is monetary policy. And monetary policy is actions by a central bank. In the United States, uh, our central bank is called the U.S. Federal Reserve, or also known as the Fed. Um, and they have a dual mandate, which is price stability and maximizing employment. And so they're the ones concerned with interest rates and the money supply. And so for this year's topic, we're really just talking about the fiscal side of things. We're talking about taxes and spending. We're not talking about interest rates as much. Um, or, or if we are, we're talking about that um, as an outcome of fiscal policy rather than um, someone directly arguing um, for higher or lower interest rates, that kind of thing. So what is fiscal redistribution? At its core, fiscal redistribution is distributing societal goods differently. It is distributing the goods we have in a society um, differently than we are right now. When we're talking fiscal redistribution, um, the redistribution part means distributing from haves to have nots. So um, in general, most good definitions of fiscal redistribution talk about uh, redistributing from those who have more to those who have less. Um, there are, you know, there, there are occasionally people who say we should redistribute from those who have less to those who have more. Um, but in general, uh, most definitions of fiscal redistribution are talking about distributing from those who have more to those who have less. And in general, the concept of fiscal redistribution includes both a tax and a transfer. So it is um, the concept of redistributing, distributing the goods differently. Um, and that is taking in uh, revenue from taxes and transferring that revenue to um, other folks in the society. Um, and most definitions of fiscal redistribution, not all, but most definitions also say that the tax must be a progressive tax. And it's worth talking for a minute about what that means. So. Progressive taxes versus regressive taxes. You might have learned this in your economics class, um, but there are multiple kinds of taxes um, and two major categories are progressive and regressive. Um, a progressive tax is a tax that takes a, a larger percentage of income from high income groups um, than from low income groups. And again, we're talking on a percentage basis, not just um, you know taking in more money from them, but a, a greater percentage of them. Um, our income tax in the United States is, is relatively progressive. Um, and uh, on the other hand, a regressive tax is a tax that takes a larger percentage of income from low income groups than for high income groups. Um, our uh, sales tax tends to be quite regressive because people who are at the lower end of the economic scale um, have to pay more of their income to buy their basic goods and services, to buy you know, things like clothing or food or um, you know, the basic things we need to, to get through life, our, our toothpaste and that sort of thing. Um, and so if you're spending a greater percentage of your income um, buying things that have a sales tax, um, then the sales tax has a relatively regressive effect. It's taking a larger percentage of income from those at the lower end of, of the economic scale than, than the wealthiest people in society. Um, payroll taxes, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, also tend to be relatively regressive. Um, as, a, as a bonus, a proportional tax is a tax that takes the same percentage of income from all income groups. If you ever heard of a flat tax, um, that's sort of what they're talking about there. 
So what are some ways for the government to raise revenue through taxation? Um, the government could certainly increase existing tax rates. Um, so, you know, if you were taxed X percent now, now you're taxed X plus 3 percent um, would be a very simple way for the government to raise revenue through taxation. Um, the government could also create a new tax, um, creating a tax on carbon or creating a new tax on um, wealth um, are both examples of things that people advocate um, that are new taxes that don't exist right now. Um, and they would be a tax um, that would also raise revenue from the government. Um, and then another one would be to close existing tax loopholes. So there are a number of loopholes um, in our taxation that allow, um, you know, pass through businesses and other things that allow people to, um, you know, evade taxes in a legal manner. Um, and if you could, you could close those tax loopholes in order to raise additional revenue. So major sources of federal tax revenue. Um, the, the most of our federal tax revenue comes from two sources. The first is income tax. Um, that's the, the taxes we're talking about generally when people talk about doing their taxes. It's like um, if your family talks about needing to do their taxes right around April 15th, they're probably talking about income tax. Uh, and income tax funds the U.S. general funds. So things like defense and education and transportation um, are all funded by the income tax. And the income tax is paid by workers. So if you get an income, um, you then pay taxes on that income. Um, and uh, you that is called the income tax. The payroll tax, on the other hand, um, fund special programs, including unemployment, Social Security, and Medicare, um, and that is paid by both workers and employers. So in general, um, the worker pays half and the employer pays half. Um, the payroll tax tends to be a little bit more regressive than the income tax um, because uh, people who are at the uh, lower levels of income in society tend to get more of their money from direct income, whereas people, you know, from their job, um, whereas the wealthiest in society tend to get more of their income from other sources. Um, but in general, uh, the two major sources of federal tax revenue are the income tax and the payroll tax. You've probably heard people complaining about taxes and how high they are, um, but it's important to know that people who are the wealthiest in our society pay far less than they used to. Um, this shows you both the top marginal tax rate um, and from different sources. So you'll see that that uh, sort of turquoisey line is uh, the top income tax rate, and that has gone down pretty significantly in the uh, you know in the 1940s and 1950s. It was quite high and then began to plummet, um, you know, as the as the 70s and 80s came along um, and has has relatively declined over time. Uh, the top corporate tax rate, um, you know, increased all the way into the 70s as well and then has also declined pretty significantly. Um, you will see uh, the those last set of tax cuts um, are sort of those little lines at the very end, um, taking us into 2014 um, to into into today um, is a is a set of tax cuts that um, have reduced taxes overall. Um, payroll tax has stayed about the same and has really just mostly increased over time again. Um, and, and so that um, demonstrates sort of where we're at in society where um, the top income tax rate, which again is the amount you earn on your last dollar. So um, how much the very top income bracket pays, the people who earn the very, very most in society, how much they're paying on that last amount of money um, has declined pretty significantly, um, thus meaning uh, that wealthy folks are paying much less in taxes on a relative basis than they used to. I, I, there are very few black quotes in this topic lecture, but I think this one was worth uh, unpacking in detail. This is from a book called Tackling the Tax Code, um, and it's about how to um, raise government revenue in a way that's more equitable. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read this to you. It says, since the late 1960s, the share of federal revenue paid by working Americans in the form of payroll taxes has increased from just over 20% to 35%. Yet corporate tax collections have plummeted from more than 25% to less than 10% of revenues. And the top rate paid by wealthy filers has fallen from 70% during Lyndon Johnson's presidency to 37% today. And over the last two decades, Congress has hollowed out the estate tax to an extent that only 0.2% of estates pay any tax at all. So um, again, as discussed, um, payroll taxes tend to be a little bit more regressive, um, and uh, income taxes or uh, income taxes and corporate taxes tend to be more progressive. But the amount that we're collecting from the more progressive taxes has declined, where the amount we're collecting from the regressive taxes increased, um, thus making our overall tax system less less equitable over time. Federal revenue um, from taxation, meaning just how much the government collects from taxes, has also declined um, even as spending has increased. You'll you'll notice um, that those two lines stayed pretty close together until again the 1980s, um, and after that, um, you know, spending has sort of outpaced revenue as we've cut taxes, even as the federal government has continued to spend the same or more. Um, so these are as a percentage of our GDP. 
Um, but overall, you'll see the sort of divergence of those lines, especially lately, um, where uh, our spending is outpacing our revenue. Um, and a lot of that is because our revenue has declined um, as tax rates have declined. U.S. revenue is also relatively low compared to other countries. So you'll you'll see the purple line there is the average of all the OECD countries. Um, and that turquoise line way over on the right, um, uh, almost on the very right, is how much the United States takes in as a percentage of our GDP. So again, this isn't an absolute amount. Obviously, um, you know, the U.S. federal government takes in more than a lot of uh, much smaller economies um, that are that are further over on the left. But as a percentage of our GDP, um, our government takes in much less through taxes um, than than others do. Um, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, in, in the United States federalized system, um, the federal government actually takes in quite a lot less. Um, if you look at that sort of filled in turquoise line um, near the bottom, um, that's the federal revenue. Some of the gap is made up by state and local revenue. Um, but even there, with even with state and local revenue, the United States um, still takes in a, a very large, uh, a very small percent of our um, income from taxes uh, relative to other countries. So fundamentally, uh, the resolution is asking the affirmative to propose a progressive tax and then transfer the funds generated by that tax to lower income individuals. Um, and there are going to be some topicality debates where you can quibble over um, whether the uh, affirmative has to actually propose a new tax or whether they can just use existing tax funds or even deficit spend. Um, I think that will be an interesting debate on the topic. Um, but um, the the question the resolution is asking the affirmative to is how can we distribute the goods in our society differently? How can we distribute more um, from those who have a lot to those who have a lot less? So what are some ways to transfer resources? Um, one is in-kind benefits. Um, and in-kind benefits are where the government directly provides goods and services to the person who's struggling. Um, these are things like Medicare and Medicaid, um, where they provide health care to someone who is struggling, SNAP or food stamps, um, where someone gets vouchers directly for food. Um, they, they can't choose to use that on something else. The, the voucher only goes to food or housing assistance, um, also known as subsidized housing or housing vouchers, um, where uh, the person gets money for housing um, and it can only be used on housing. They get assistance um, getting that housing. Um, in-kind benefits tend to be less redistributive um, because a lot of the benefit goes to the person um, who is providing the resource rather than the person who's living in poverty. So for example, um, if someone is on food stamps, um, they obviously get the benefit of uh, the food, but the revenue from that transaction goes to, you know, Kroger or Walmart or wherever that person is getting their groceries. Same thing with housing assistance. Um, when someone gets a housing voucher, they get the benefit of the housing, but the, the revenue from that transaction goes to the landlord. Um, and so for that reason, in-kind benefits tend to be less redistributive. They tend to, um, you know, provide some, provide benefits to, to people living in poverty, but they also provide a, a maybe even more significant benefit um, to the middle class people who are the, the care providers, the doctors providing the Medicare, Medicaid, the um, grocery stores, the landlords, that sort of thing. Cash transfers is, is what you think it is. It's providing money directly to the person who is struggling. Um, so for example, um, Social Security gives money monthly to um, a variety of people that we'll talk about in, in a couple of slides, um, but it is tends to be more redistributive because the money goes directly to the person who is struggling um, and then they decide how they want to allocate um, their funds. Um, there are also a few other ways to transfer resources. You can give subsidies, um, which is sometimes included under in-kind benefits. You can provide services to the person, um, or you can give tax rebates. Um, but again, the two main categories are in-kind benefits and cash transfers. In the United States, most federal programs are in-kind benefits rather than cash transfers, um, and that tends to be for two reasons. One is that uh, in-kind benefits tend to be much more popular um, for people who think that people living in poverty aren't going to use um, their benefits the way that the government thinks they should. This provides government control over how those benefits are used. Um, and it also ensures that the, the middle class providers benefit. So um, landlords certainly prefer housing assistance vouchers to um, providing money directly and, and same with um, you know, medical providers and that sort of thing. So um, those tend to be more popular politically. Um, the other reason is that in uh, the way poverty is viewed in our society is sort of as a temporary condition needing 
uh, you know, brief amelioration rather than a, a long-term thing requiring redistribution. Um, and so um, rather than thinking of our society as trying to redistribute wealth, um, we tend to think of it as sort of a safety net um, for those who are, are struggling at the time. So what methods of transfer are included in the resolution? Um, adopting a federal jobs guarantee, expanding social security, and providing a basic income. And we'll look at all three of those. First is the federal jobs guarantee. So what is a federal jobs guarantee? A federal jobs guarantee, um, the concept came out of a massive expansion of federal hiring programs. Um, the first one in the United States was the New Deal. Um, and then again in the 1970s, public service employment. But the concept is that in a federal jobs guarantee, anyone who wants to work is eligible. And if that person can't find a private sector job, if they can't find a job, you know, working for a business or, um, you know, working um, just, you know, at a restaurant, that kind of thing, um, then the government will provide them a job. And so it essentially guarantees full employment in society because anyone who wants to work would be able to work. And one thing to understand about the unemployment rate is that the unemployment rate is actually generally of, of at, people who are actually unemployed is, is generally about twice as high as the reported unemployment rate, because in a lot of cases, people have stopped looking for work. And so those folks are not counted in the federal unemployment rate. Um, the jobs guarantee would, would offer work for everyone who's looking for a job. Um, and it would essentially offer that with pay sufficient to provide a living wage um, is the what most advocates of a federal jobs guarantee um, would guarantee. So um, it's not just any job, it is a job that provides a living wage um, and generally some benefits. So what kind of jobs could be included? Well, it could be anything, um, but popular proposals include environment care. That's the, the green jobs. If you hear about the Green New Deal, um, that is a popular proposal that includes a jobs guarantee um, that would allow um, people to work in environment cleanup and building um, resources that would help um, alleviate climate change and help um, you know prevent the, the problems from climate change, that kind of thing. Those are called green jobs. Um, another category would be community care. So um, this is things like uh, building uh, infrastructure, that kind of thing in our society. And then people care, um, taking care of those in our society who are struggling. Um, there's a lot of elder care that gets ignored. There's a lot of child care that gets ignored. Um, and giving a job guarantee for those kinds of work um, would mean a lot more people are cared for. There are some drawbacks and objections to uh, a, a federal jobs guarantee, as there are for most proposals. Um, the sort of general set of objections, a, a jobs guarantee would be pretty expensive um, and, you know, so you'd have to figure out how to pay for it. Um, some people say it would cause inflation because if everybody has a job, then, you know, everyone can buy things. Um, the obvious answer, the flip side of that is, of course, um, that, you know, maybe we shouldn't have a society that counts against inflation by making sure that some people can't afford anything. But um, the negative would say that inflation is a possible drawback or objection to a, a jobs guarantee. Um, jobs guarantees tend to be pretty difficult to administer because uh, you have to like find jobs for people and make jobs where they don't exist. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in, in creating jobs. Um, and then it might hurt private businesses. So there are there are trade-offs and economic pressure to private businesses um, that maybe people wouldn't want to work in those private businesses anymore. Um, and it might hurt those businesses if people could get a, a job from the government. Um, many of the jobs are also what they would call make work jobs. So there are jobs that don't necessarily need to be done, um, but are created just for the jobs guarantee. Um, and that's also a, a drawback and objection to a jobs guarantee. The next category is social security. So we, we should look a little bit at what is social security um, and then we'll talk about how we could expand it. So social security is, is financial benefits for retirees or disabled individuals or survivors, um, meaning that you, um, like lots of times it is children under 18 who have had a parent pass away are eligible for social security. Um, and uh, so are uh, people who are married to someone who is eligible for social security. And if that person passes away, then they get um, survivor benefits from social security. 65 million people receive Social Security benefits each year as of 2020, um, and re the retirement group was the biggest group by far. Um, the survivors and disabled individuals group is much smaller than the, the retirees category. As we talked about earlier, it's funded by payroll taxes, um, which means that um, it's not coming from the general funds. It is, is specifically designated um, from the set of funds that is funded by payroll taxes. So how could Social Security be expanded? Um, they could increase the payment amounts. So that, that would be the simplest version is just pay more to existing people who are eligible to Social Security. Um, you could also lower the retirement age, which would mean that a larger group of people would be counted as retirees and thus be eligible for Social Security. 
and you could expand eligibility groups. So um, Social Security could be expanded to cover um, people, more people with disabilities. It could be expanded to cover um, people who are pregnant or people who have recently given birth to children. It could be expanded to cover, you know, all sorts of folks in society um, that are not currently covered by Social Security um, and could be covered by Social Security in the future. Drawbacks and objections. Again, it's it's expensive. Um, you know, Social Security is a huge percent of the federal budget. It's about 22 percent of the federal budget goes to Social Security, um, and it might cause inflation um, and it might hurt private businesses if people were to retire sooner. That that could potentially hurt businesses. Last category is is basic income, um, or sometimes referred to as universal basic income, and we'll talk about the difference between those two concepts in a second. But a basic income is an amount of money distributed periodically. So it's the federal government giving money directly to individuals. Um, some proposals for basic incomes are means tested, meaning um, it only is given to people below a certain um, income or wealth level in society. So it's given to the to the least well off in society. Um, some proposals for basic income are, are given to everyone, and that's the universal basic income, which we'll look at in just a moment. Um, in general, basic income is not tied to work. It is an income provided separate from work. Um, it tends to be much easier to administer than a federal jobs guarantee because you don't have to have the bureaucracy to create those jobs, the administrative burden of creating those jobs and then monitoring those jobs, that kind of thing. Um, the One of the benefits is it gives people freedom to take low-income jobs. There are lots of people who would be artists or they would be poets or they would um, you know, stay home to take care of, of a child or an elderly family member or someone who's disabled. Um, and they can't do that because um, they don't have the resources to, to do so. A basic income would provide resources to those folks um, to pursue uh, those things, which um, you know many think are beneficial to society. And that's sort of one of the benefits of basic income. Um, we actually have an example in the United States, um, the Alaska Permanent Fund. Uh, each resident of Alaska gets about $2,000 each year from the Alaska oil revenues um, just for living in the state of Alaska. Another term you're going to hear a lot is universal basic income or UBI. Um, and a universal basic income is the same concept as a basic income, um, but it's that every adult gets an equal amount of money distributed periodically. Um, and a universal basic income is not means tested. You get that um, whether you're the richest person in society or the least well off in society, you get the same amount distributed. Um, so it is not based on your means, how much you have. Um, and um, a lot of the people who uh, prefer a universal basic income, think that it is, um, you know, sort of more durable, um, easier to administer because you don't have to figure out how much people have in order to distribute it. Um, and it, it provides a lot of stability and a lot of reliability for um, everyone in society. There are some drawbacks and objections, of course. Again, it's expensive. It might cause inflation. Um, it might mean people won't work, um, that if people, you know, did have an income that they could count on, even if it's a relatively small income, um, that they might decide that they didn't want to, to work in their job, um, and thus, you know, hurt private businesses. Um, and then there are folks who say just sort of work is fulfilling, um, that, that being able to participate in work in society, um, is a, is a fulfilling endeavor. And so, um, we should encourage people to work, um, as much as possible. The benefits or the people who advocate for basic income or universal basic income think that um, all of these things are, are relatively surmountable, especially because, um, you know, a basic income might provide at a level, a survival level, but maybe not the level that um, people would want to in order to continue working, that m most people would probably continue working, but they might work at different jobs or they might take some time off to care for a family member and then return to work, that sort of thing. Um, those are sort of the concepts in the resolution. So I really appreciate you taking the time to watch um, and I hope you have a great season of debating. Take care.